John Carreyrou. He's the man who broke the Theranos story in the Wall Street Journal, and he's the author of the best-selling book on the scandal, Bad Blood. So, in a nutshell, and great to have you with us, um, explain what the technology was, what, what Elizabeth Holmes was selling here, and how she managed to convince some pretty incredible investors to part with the total of, what, $1 billion worth of cash? Right. So she claimed that she had invented a uh, semi-portable device that could do all the blood tests known to man, which is, if you ask experts, anywhere from several hundred to several thousand blood tests off a tiny uh, a drop prick. of blood, a pinprick of yeah. blood pricked from the finger, and, um, and get results uh, within a few hours and offer these tests for uh, you know, much less than other labs. And actually, that would have been a great advance because up until even still today, no one has figured out how to run that many blood tests on a tiny sample of blood. The reason is that there are actually different classes of blood tests which require completely different laboratory instruments and laboratory techniques. And when you've done one class of test off a tiny blood sample, you don't have enough sample yes. left to do the other types of tests. So this is still an, a nut that hasn't been cracked to this day, but she claimed that she had cracked it. How did she get all this money well uh, Theranos had raised some money in its early years but about a decade in in late 2013 she went live with her supposedly innovative technology in Walgreens stores in California and Arizona and based on that she solicited new funding and she studiously avoided sophisticated uh, med tech Silicon Valley investors and instead went to uh, the family offices of billionaires, the likes of Rupert Murdoch or the Cox billionaire family in Atlanta, Carlos Slim, the Mexican billionaire, yes. uh, Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, her family. And she did these, these fake demos with what was essentially just a prototype and a malfunctioning one for these investors. And they saw that the blood tests were being offered in Walgreens stores and they thought, surely this must be real. And so they put in another $700 million into the company. I mean, you're basically saying she was lying. I mean, she was using Siemens testing machines. Right. She was using traditional machines and saying that it was this little box. And right. They were faking results. I mean, it was... Right. Well, they, were, they had 250 blood tests on their menu, and about 240 of those were done on Siemens machines, the German conglomerate, which has a diagnostic equipment unit. And they had hacked the Siemens machines, and, and to adapt the small blood samples, they would dilute them to create more volume because the Siemens machines were used to doing regular size samples and then only a, a, a little subgroup of 10 tests were done with a previous iteration of the Theranos technology which she had called the Edison after the famous inventor yes. Thomas Edison and that that machine was not reliable and so those blood tests eventually were all voided um, and so a million blood test results were voided in the end. You know, I mean I hate needles. We've all had one of those blood tests where they take several files of blood. This would have been revolutionary. But I bring it back to the fact that, as you said, you know, doctors have not been able to achieve this. We simply haven't been able to achieve this. So you've got doctors going, this is not possible. My question is, you know, she, she managed to fool the CEO of Walgreens. Where were the regulators here? Who was looking at this product or looking at the labs and going, what's going on here? Because when it comes down to it, it was putting people's lives at risk. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you, you can fault the regulators to some extent, but the regulators were also being lied to. Uh, when an, an inspector, a state inspector, uh, came to inspect the lab in early uh, December 2013, she was not shown the part downstairs where the proprietary Edison machines and the hacked Siemens machines were. She was only shown the upstairs, upstairs part of the lab, which looked perfectly normal. It had regular diagnostic equipment, and Theranos uh, represented to the state inspector that those were the machines machines that they were using and only those so that state inspector was hoodwinked uh, similarly the FDA was in, in regular contact with uh, Theranos about approving its innovative tests and uh, Theranos was lying to the FDA about what exactly it was doing back in its lab so does this say more about that period of time because you broke the news in in 2015 and you came under a lot of pressure and we can talk a little bit about that but does it say more about 
who Elizabeth Holmes was as a woman that she managed to convince all these people that she had the, the next biggest thing in a healthcare revolution? Or does it say more about Silicon Valley and the desire of these investors? They were so desperate to find right. the next big thing and be an early investor yep. that actually they were willing to chuck money at something like right. this. Um, I think it's a, it's a combination of both. She's an incredibly charismatic. Um, if you go back to clips of her uh, when she was being interviewed uh, on TV or when she was at conferences, uh, she had this deep voice yes. and this, uh, this sort of really um, seemingly genuine pitch. And uh, she's also very smart. Um, and she sort of uh, put a spell on, on all these people, uh, including many older men, it must be said, because uh, she, her board was made up of a lot of uh, aging ex-statesmen and military commanders, and, and she also hoodwinked David Boyes, the famous lawyer, and Rupert Murdoch, the owner of my newspaper. Well, she tried to convince Rupert she, Murdoch right, to quash the story when right. you were working on I it. I learned later, I didn't know at the time, but she, she tried twice to, to convince uh, Rupert to, to kill the story before it was published. Um, but it's also, uh, the other factor is there was this hunger in Silicon Valley to see a woman succeed. There hadn't been a female founder who had become a billionaire, and she was going to be the first one. And she tapped into that yearning and, and really capitalized on it. There's so many different ways and so many different angles I could take here. Do you think, based on all the evidence that you collected, that this could happen again, that this kind of situation with a company, with investors, with, with lives being put at right. risk could happen again? Or do you think this was a one-off and there were a sequence, a special confluence of factors here actually right. that made this what it was and ultimately a $9 billion company that's now going out of business? Right, it's being dissolved as we speak. I, I'd like to think that um, it, it was a unique event and that especially now that, that the scandal has been exposed, that it's going to be a cautionary tale and that health regulators are going to be much uh, more uh, aware and on their guards about what Silicon Valley is up to. Um, but I must say that um, I think the Silicon Valley ecosystem with these unicorns uh, that have grown you know, to have incredible valuations, you think of, a, of an Uber, it's a $50 billion yeah. valuation. And a lot of these companies are still private. They haven't gone, uh, they haven't IPO'd, they haven't gone to the public markets, and so they're still able to conduct their, their business uh, behind closed doors, so to speak. They don't have to take analyst calls, they don't have to put out quarterly uh, results, and, and that uh, lends itself to uh, excess and to cutting corners. And so I don't think we've seen the end of, uh, you know, this sort of behavior in Silicon Valley, um, this, this unicorn boom is still ongoing. Yeah.